the diseases will show you granular pattern. Okay, and anti GBM disease will show you linear pattern of immunofluorescence. So, without understanding the basic of what we are going to see in kidney biopsy, we cannot go further. And the third investigation is electron microscopy. So, what does electron microscopy tell us? So, just now I have told you, just now I have shown you this structure. Okay, so as you all know, this is basement membrane, endothelium, and visceral epithelial cells. Deposits in the subendothelial sub or subepithelial deposits. How will you know that? That is seen on electron microscopy. So, electron microscopy helps you picking up the site of deposit where the deposits are actually present, is seen on electron microscopy. Okay, and next important point that Electron microscope help us to pick up as basement of food processes. So you all know that this is the basement membrane and visceral epithelial cells are present over the basement membrane with the help of its food processes. Effacement means that there is loss of these foot processes, loss of these foot processes. This is also seen on electron microscopy. This is also seen on electron microscopy only. Third point electron microscopy tells you is changes in the structure of the basement membrane. For example, I told you the basement membrane is made up of three parts. Lamina densa, rara interna, rara externa. So any alteration in the structure is also seen only by electron microscopy. So these are the three important things you see on electron microscopy. The, the site of deposit, the, any alteration in the basement membrane and any changes occurring in the foot process, loss of foot process, effacement of foot process or denudation of foot process, all this is seen on electron microscopy. So whenever now we are going to go ahead into the lesions. So whenever we are going to study kidney, we are going to ask ourselves few questions and that will help us understanding the chapter really well. So in any kidney disease, number one question you should ask is whether the disease is immune complex mediated or non-immune disease. If it is an immune complex mediated disease, next question you should ask yourself what is the antigen? Okay. Then third question you should ask. What is the site of deposit of the immune complex? After site of deposit, what you should know is what are the changes seen in the light microscopy, electron microscopy and immunofluorescence. Okay. And this is how this will clear all your doubts in kidney. Okay, with this we will now enter into the spectrum of glomerulopathies which we are going to study now. One more last thing I want to tell about kidney biopsy is you have to see involvement of kidney biopsies. Okay, involvement of glomeruli in the kidney biopsy. This is again important basic concept that you should know. If more than in a kidney, more than 50% of glomeruli of the kidney are involved, then this disease is known as diffuse involvement of the kidney. If less than 50% of the glomeruli are involved, then it is called as focal involvement of the kidney. Okay? If you see a single glomerulus and it is completely involved, then the involvement is known as global. And if you see a single glomerulus and it is partly or segmentally involved, then that is known as segmental. So I'll just give you a small example of it and you tell me what is it. Must have heard this entity? FSGS, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. That means focal means less than 50% of the glomeruli are involved. Segmental and those which are involved are also segmentally involved, partly involved. Glomerulosclerosis. So I hope you know the terminology well now. Focal, segmental, diffuse, global, right? So these terminologies should be very clear to you and they are asked in MCQ those. So now 
we are entering into the spectrum of glomerulopathy. Okay, we'll not go into much clinical. We'll go more into pathological part of renal pathology. Now, clinical presentations can be broadly classified into two types: nephrotic or nephritic. So, any patient coming to you with nephrotic picture is the patient having albuminuria that is more than 3.5 gram of proteins are secreted per day. This is beyond the reparative capacity of the liver. So, the patient has hypoalbuminuria, hypoalbuminemia, decrease on cortic pressure leads to edema. Then a patient also has lipiduria and therefore the liver compensates, it starts increasing more lipid and the patient has hyperlipidemia. So, this is in general spectrum of nephrotic which you will be studying in your pediatrics and medicine. Or a patient can come with a nephritic picture that is he has, he presents with hematuria that is red blood cells in the urine, oliguria, hypertension and azotemia. Azotemia is increased blood urea nitrogen. So now we will, we are more concerned about pathology. So which are the pathological lesions which present with nephrotic picture? So we have three distinct lesions which present as nephrotic picture. One, minimal change disease. Second, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And third, membranous nephropathy. Okay, please note. There are two other diseases which can present as nephrotic. These are MPGN and IgA. So MPGN can present as a spectrum of both nephrotic and nephritic. It can show you both pictures. Whereas IgA is predominantly a glomerulonephritis, but it can rarely show, it can rarely present as nephrotic syndrome also. Predominantly it is glomerulonephritis. That is why I have highlighted this. So they can present both with the pictures, different pictures of a mixture. MPG can present as a mixture of nephrotic and nephritic. And IgA predominantly presents as glomerulonephritis and rarely as nephrotic syndrome. Out of these three, I will just tell you the salient point. Which is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults? This is FSGS. So, most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults is FSGS. Most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children? It is minimal change disease. Most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in elderly? It is membranous. Okay. Now coming to the nephritic picture. Again we have three diseases which classically present with a nephritic picture. First, acute proliferative glomerulonephritis. The typical prototype of acute proliferative glomerulonephritis is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis also known as PSGN. The second prototype of glomerulonephritis is RPGN that is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And third is IgA nephropathy. As I have already told you, IgA nephropathy predominantly presents as glomerulonephritis. It can rarely present as nephrotic syndrome. Okay. Just like we have studied most common here, here also, which is the most common cause of glomerulonephritis worldwide? It is IgA nephropathy. Most common cause of glomerulonephritis worldwide is IgA nephropathy. But in India, the most common cause of glomerulonephritis is still PSGN. In India, the most common cause is still PSGN. And RPGN is the end stage renal disease. It is end stage renal disease. Okay. So, this is a basic chart which helps you to understand which lesions present as what presentations. So, today we will uh, focus our lecture on the lesions which present with nephritic morphology and cover three lesions PSGN, RPGN, and IgA. So 
the first disease which we are going to study is acute proliferated glomerulonephritis. This is the first prototype of glomerulonephritis. So name is acute proliferated glomerulonephritis. So what does it mean? It means that there is proliferation of the glomerular cells and there is infiltration of the inflammatory cells. So acute proliferative glomerulonephritis means proliferation of the glomerular cells and infiltration of the inflammatory cells. So which are the glomerular cells which are known to proliferate in APGN? They are endothelial cells and mesangial cells. So they are two types of cells, endothelial and mesangial cells. So these are the two cells which proliferate, right? And there is infiltration of a lot of inflammatory cells. Okay. Now, let's, I have already told you, whenever you study kidney, first ask whether it is an immune complex mediated disease or not. Yes, it is an immune complex mediated disease. The next question, what is the antigen? The antigen can be either exogenous antigen or endogenous, endogenous antigen. So, exogenous antigen most commonly is infection. So, this is also known as post-infective glomerulonephritis. PIGN is the other name of APGN. Okay. So, what is the most common infection which is known to cause APGN? It is group A beta hemolytic streptococci which strain 1241. So, these three strains are very commonly known to cause acute proliferative glomerulonephritis. Now, <clears throat> Sometimes the antigen can be endogenous itself. Endogenous antigen like DNA. So this causes the lesion. This is known as SLE nephritis. So SLE nephritis is also a type of acute proliferative glomerulonephritis. Right? And it is due to an endogenous antigen. So whenever these are antigens are present, then it leads to formation of immune complexes. These immune complexes always activate complement and therefore patient develops hypocomplementemia and this complement also causes injury to the glomerular cells but at levels decreases in the blood known as hypocomplementemia. But this hypocomplementemia caused by PSGN or PIGN is always transient. Why is it transient? Because it's an infection. Mesangial cells are getting activated. Inflammatory cells are coming to eat up the deposits. So it clears itself up in approximately 4 to 6 weeks. So this is always transient hypercomplementemia. If hypercomplementemia persists for more than 6 weeks um, or more duration, you should think of cause other than PSGN or PIGN. The, what is the next question which you should ask yourself? Location of the immune deposits. Where is the immune complex deposited? So immune complexes in PIGN is initially deposited in the subendothelial location and therefore it incites so high inflammation, so high inflammation, there is lots of inflammation because the deposits initially are present in the subendothelial region. Later on, the reasons are not yet known, but these deposits dissociate and move to the sub-epithelial side. So, this antigens dissociate and move to the sub-epithelial sides. And they are big deposits, so they are also known as humps. So, they are also known as humps. So, remember, in later stages of PSGN, the deposits will be seen in the sub-epithelial side. But in initial stages, the deposits can also be seen in sub-endothelial sites. So, this is a very, very important concept. Now, one new, new change that has been done in new Robins is, the what is the new antigen? Earlier, Robins used to give a long list of antigens which were postulated to cause PSGN. The new Robins have said, this is probably the most common antigen, streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxin B. This is streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxin B. This is the most commonly implicated antigen and it is also seen to be found in the humps. So this is the new addition in the province 9. Now, 
After this, what are we going to discuss? The changes in the light microscopy, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy in APGN. So, light microscopy, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy of the PSGN or APGN or PIGN, same thing, okay? On light microscopy, so you, what you want to see is, there is lot of proliferation first, the glomerulus is hypercellular, number one glomerulus is hypercellular. So I told you there is proliferation of endothelial cells as well as in the mesangial cells. So endothelial cells starts proliferating, so this is the basement membrane, okay and this is the blood vessel we know okay so the endothelial cells start proliferating they become more prominent they start proliferating and lot of inflammatory cells also come into being so this is known as endocapillary proliferation so this is known as endocapillary proliferation. So there is hypercellular glomeruli. You can see that the endothelial cells have become more prominent. They have started proliferating and there are a lot of inflammatory cells. And this is known as endocapillary proliferation. So sometimes there is so much proliferation of endothelial cells that you cannot even see the blood vessels in human. So this is also known as bloodless glomeruli. So this light microscopy finding is also known as bloodless glomeruli. And third, there is lot of inflammatory cells, both neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, everyone has come to eat up the deposits. Okay. On immunofluorescence, what do you see? You see that there are all the types of antibodies are there in the glomerulus and what is the location of these deposits? So I already have explained you the deposits were initially present around the subendothelial location and then they migrate into the subepithelial location. So the deposits are seen along the basement membrane. The deposits are seen along the basement membrane. Number one and number two, what is the nature of deposits? These are granular deposits. So again, this is the granular deposits, right? So, so many type of antibodies in the glomerulus together and granular deposits, this appearance is also known as starry sky immunofluorescence. So, lot of antibodies start shining, so it looks like stars. So, this is also known as starry sky immunofluorescence. So, the, so friends, you will be knowing uh, which is the other condition in which you see starry sky appearance? Yes, in hematology. Yes, it's Burkitt's lymphoma. So Burkitt's lymphoma is another lymphoma where you see starry sky pattern. But this is starry sky immunofluorescence. So starry sky immunofluorescence is a feature of PSGN. Okay, and coming to electron microscopy. So you know more than me. The deposits are in the later stages are actually present on the subepithelial side and they are very bulky, big deposits, so they are known as humps. These deposits on the subepithelial side are known as humps. Okay. Sometimes the deposits can or in early stages the deposits can also be seen in the subendothelial location, right? So since this is an infective etiology, most of it, most of the children will recover with time, okay? Very few of them progress to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or chronic glomerulonephritis. So prognosis is very good in PSGM. So 
Everybody clear with this? So now we move to the second uh, glomerulonephritis, second type of glomerulonephritis, which is known as RPGA, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, also known as chrysentric glomerulonephritis. So the hallmark of RPGA and the characteristic feature of RPGA is severe glomerular injury. Whenever there is a severe glomerular injury, the patient progresses to RPGA, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. It is very, very, very important to quickly identify this entity because if not identified, it leads to death of the patient within weeks. So it's very, very important to identify this entity. So let's see the pathogenesis first. Okay. So whenever there is a severe glomerular injury, what happens? All the proteins, procoagulants, leak into the Bowman capsule. One very peculiar of them is fibrin. Fibrin and cytokines leak into the Bowman's capsule. And they act, fibrin act as a minus. And cytokines and growth factors cause proliferation of parietal epithelial cells around this fibrin. Right? So there are, there is a lot of proliferation of parietal epithelial cells. And all the macrophages, neutrophils also get influxed into the Bowman's capsule and they will start leading to the proliferation of parietal epithelial cell. So this is what is known as crescent. So crescent is a proliferation of parietal epithelial cells along with neutrophils, lymphocytes, macrophages and the most important nidus of the crescent is so if you know the pathogenesis, you will never go the wrong. So the most important nidus here is fibrin. So fibrin acts as a nidus. Okay, so this is the hallmark lesion of RPGN. This is seen in all the type of RPGN. Now, all the types means what? So as I have already told you, you will always ask yourself what is the etiology of the disease. So the disease can be due to three basic types and that is why it is also classified into three types type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 is 20 percent type 2 25 percent and type 3 is 55 percent the total okay so type 1 rpgn is also known as anti-gbm disease anti-gbm disease because the most common antigen here in this case is alpha 3 chain of alpha 3 chain of collagen type 4 so non collagenous domain of collagenous type 4 and which chain alpha 3 so alpha 3 non collagenous domain of collagen type 4 is the most common antigen for the RPGN now this antigen why is it formed it is not yet known but some patients have a tendency to form antigen against this component of the basement membrane and then the disease is known as anti-GBM disease. In some of these patients, this antibody can also react with the pulmonary capillaries, pulmonary basement membranes. Then that syndrome is known as good pasture syndrome. Then that syndrome is known as good pasture syndrome. So this antibody is formed against intrinsic fixed antigen of the kidney that is basement membrane. Okay. So prototype good Paxi syndrome can be seen in this. So, so this type, the, what is the cure of this type? Usually they say plasma is very effective in type 1 RPGN because you can remove this antibody by plasma ferrosis and patient improves. Right? Type 2 RPGN. In type 2 RPGN is caused by immune complex mediated disease. Any disease which is immune complex mediated can progress into RPGN type 2. So just like I told you before itself, most of the PSGN patients cure. Only few of them progress to RPGN. So the MCQ can be asked or question can be asked. Which type of RPGN does? PSGN patients go into 
So they move into RPG and type 2. So RPG and type 2 is due to immune complex mediated diseases. So any of these immune complex mediated diseases, PSGNS and EIGNA, probably HSV, can lead to immune complex mediated, can lead to RPG and type 2. Okay. And third is posse immune. So this is a very common type of RPG and also known as posse immune type of RPG. Now this type of RPG is ANCA mediated. What is ANCA? Anti neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody. These are the antibodies very commonly seen in vasculitis. They are targeted against some of the component of the neutrophils or granulocytes. So most so there are two types of ANCA, C ANCA and P ANCA. C ANCA is implicated in Wigner's granulomatosis and P ANCA is implicated in microscopic polyangitis. This you will study more in detail in vasculitis. But the important part is most of the ANCA mediated diseases in kidney in RPGN are idiopathic. Okay, they are idiopathic or sometimes they can be associated with these disorders as well. So, these are the three types of RPGN which you should know. Now, the hallmark, as I have already told you, hallmark lesion seen in RPGN is crescent and it is due to severe glomerular injury. So, now comes the question what will we see in light microscopy, electron microscopy, and immunofluorescence? Right? So, light microscopy, electron microscopy and immunofluorescence. Light microscopy for all it is same. All of them shows you presence of crescents. Now New Robbins has added one very important point. Okay. Segmental glomerular necrosis. Is a peculiar feature of type 3 RPGN. So, this is added by New Robbins. So, segmental glomerular necrosis is a feature of type 3 RPGN. Right? Okay. What about electron microscopy? Electron microscopy, one hallmark I've already told you of RPGN is severe glomerular injury. So, you will see severe breaks in the basement membrane. in all of them ok so breaks in the basement membrane will be seen in all of them apart from that type 2 RPGN will also show you immune deposits ok and the location of the deposits will depend upon the primary lesion which has progressed into RPGN so, primary nature of the deposits will depend upon the primary disease which has progressed to the RPGN. And we come to the third that is immunofluorescence. In immunofluorescence, very important, I have already told you, anti-GBM disease will show you which pattern of deposition. It will show you linear pattern of immunofluorescence. Whereas... <coughs> Immune complex mediated will show you granular pattern of immunofluorescence. And what about posse immune? Here you will see no deposits at all. Because it is posse immune and it is anchor mediated. So you will not see any deposits. So this is a very very important point. And I told you plasma paresis can cure which type of RPG and type 1 because it can remove the antibody. Whereas type 2 cannot be treated by plasma paresis. In this case, you have to treat the underlying cause which is progressing to RPGN. Right? So, these are the important points about RPGN. So, now we come to the third and the last part of the glomerulonephritis that is IgA nephropathy. Now, uh, Neurobis has classified it into a isolated glomerular disease but it is the most common cause of glomerulonephritis worldwide. It is the most common cause of glomerulonephritis worldwide. 
Okay, and the, another change which has happened in the new Robbins from the earlier edition is that earlier Robbins said that IgA is a type of immune dysregulation. Whereas the new Robin says no, it is properly immune complex mediated disease. It is immune mediated disease. So whenever I use the word immune mediated, the next question comes to what is the antigen? So the antigen in this case is aberrantly glycosylated IgA1. So this is an aberrantly glycosylated IgA1. So this acts as the antigen. The first point is that it itself has a tendency to deposit in the mesenchium and sometimes the antibodies are formed against these apparently glycosylated IgA1 and it leads to the formation of in situ immune complexes in the mesenchium. So whenever IgA is deposited you will study it in immunity that this causes activation of alternate complement pathway. So in this also alternate complement pathway is activated. So what happens in alternate complement pathway? C3 is directly activated. The earlier complement proteins are not involved. So similarly in this only C3 is activated. Early complement proteins that is C1, C2 and C4 are not involved. They are absent in the deposits. So the deposits will be composed predominantly of IgA and C3. C1, C2 and C4 will be absent. So this is a very important point. After this, we should also know the etiology. Why this IgA1 gets aberrantly glycosylated? The reason is not known but they have postulated that probably after some infection like respiratory tract infection or GIT infection or urinary tract infection, the patient develops these abnormal glycosylated forms of IgA1 and the patient presents after a latent period of 1 to 2 days with gross hematuria. This is a very peculiar finding of IgA nephropathy that is gross hematuria. And 1 to 2 days why? Because it needs antibodies to be formed against the antigen. So, it presents with gross hematuria. So, what will we see in pathology, in light microscopy, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy? In light microscopy, and as I have already told you, the deposits are present in the mesangium. So, it will cause proliferation of the mesangial cells. This is also known as mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis. So it causes proliferation of mesangium, mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis. In immunofluorescence, what will you see? You know the deposits, it is IgA and C3 and what is the nature of deposit? It is granular deposits. The deposits will be granular. And on electron microscopy, immune complexes will be seen in the mesangium. Okay, so that is the classical picture of IgA nephropathy. Apart from this, you should also know that there are two types of IgA nephropathy, primary and secondary. What happens in certain diseases like gluten enteropathy? What happens in them? In some patients with gluten enteropathy, there is more production of IgA. And... The patients with liver diseases cannot remove this aberrantly glycosylated IgA1. In these two group of patients also, they, these two group of patients are prone to develop IgA nephropathy. So, these two group of patients have high chances of developing secondary IgA nephropathy. Okay, so this is again most common cause of glomerulonephritis and it is one of the very common causes of gross hematuria, right? Glomerulonephritis, all the major diseases which manifest with glomerulonephritis and with this I want to conclude my chapter. We will not have much time to move into nephrotic syndrome right now. But before concluding I would like to tell you something about podocyte protein mutations. So we have three proteins which I have already told you in the starting point of the class that there are three genes, three proteins which you should know, nephrin, podocin, CD2AP and actin. So mutation of the nephrin protein causes finished type nephrotic syndrome. 
Please remember, nephrine is coated by a, pro, a gene known as NPHS1, which is located on 19Q chromosome. The next protein is porosin, which is coated by gene known as NPHS2, which is located on 1Q and it causes autosomal recessive FSGS. Please remember, NPHS2 is the most common gene responsible for steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. So, most common gene responsible for steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome is NPHS2. The third protein, you know, actin, alpha actin and 4, coded by a gene known as FSGS1, which is located again on 19Q. And it causes autosomal dominant FSGS. Please remember.